Greetings my friends, how are you doing? This is Zeb from Zeb Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. So I am joined once again by Marianne McGinn. Marianne, how are you doing? Hi, very well, thanks. So this video is a part two of this two-part series. In the first video, we covered a complete detailed tutorial on how to carve a spoon, where Marianne very kindly showed from complete start to finish how to carve a spoon. Now, if you haven't seen that video, I'll put a link below and that can take you to that video should you want to watch that. Now this video is a part two leading on from that. Now Marianne is a full-time professional green woodworker. She's been working with wood for most of her life and she's been teaching it as well as kind of doing it herself. And she's a very accomplished spoon carver. And so in this video, what I thought would be a great uh, thing to do would be to look at some of the techniques that Marianne deploys in her spoon carving to uh, decorate her spoons, to create some kind of embellishment. So we're gonna look at maybe two, three different techniques uh, and just to give you an idea to make you start thinking about the things that maybe you could try out in your spoon carving. Now, would you say that obviously these techniques can don't necessarily have to be restricted to spoons? They could be essentially using green woodwork in general, you know, uh, whatever it is that you're carving. Um, so this is kind of give you kind of a bit of creativity. And even for myself, I've not really played around too much with decoration of spoons and green wood. And so for me as well, I'm looking forward to actually filming this. So as you're watching this video, I'm learning also as I'm filming it. So with your kind permission, Marianne, what we'll do in this video, we'll proceed to look at some of the decoration techniques that Marianne deploys in decorating her spoons. So Marianne, for the first technique, um, if sometimes I've seen it being referred to as flutes, um, kind of like a gouging technique. Um, so with this technique, first of all, let's look at the tool that you're using. It's not anything I bought specially, it's something I found at the bottom of my toolbox. So it's got a slight curve on the end, hasn't it? Yes, it's a down. sweep. It's called a sweep. And that means that the tool won't get stuck in, it'll work its way out. It glides on this curve at the back there. That's beautiful, it's a beautiful tool that, isn't it? Very nice. So with this technique, let's talk, talk me through then. Well, I've... Um, almost finished this spoon, I haven't quite done the finishing cuts, but I've put these facets on top. You can either do that or you can have a rounded surface. If you've got facets then you've got a line that you can follow and if you've just got a rounded one you have to put your own lines in like that, however you're going to do it. So would this also correspond to the width of the gown that you've got? Um, well, if you've got wider spaces there, then you just have to do it more than once and you get a wider groove, mm -hmm. but it's more fiddly. It's nicer to have. And is it needless to say that your ideally you want to do this when the wood has dried a little? Yes. It's, um, sometimes I, I do part of it while the wood is fresh because it's easier to move the gouge along. But obviously you don't get a clean cut, so I sometimes just establish where the grooves are going to be and clean them up when the spoon's dry. You get a very nice finish then. Because it, obviously when the spoon's hard, it's, it's more difficult to control the tool. Excellent. So to start off then, what would you be doing? Well, because this is, very, this is at the end, and if you're holding it there, the chances are you're gonna dig in to your hands. So I'll probably just try and Start it off like this, if the grain allows, because it would be very painful. I can start it like that. And with most um, grooves and decorations like this, you kind of want to start so with this one, just to kind of recap, you are actually bracing it, aren't you, against the end? I'm bracing against there. Normally I would do it on my lap like that, and I can hold the chisel against my stomach. And in fact, if I breathe out, it's quite good. <laughs> <laughs> Extra power. <laughs> like that. But holding a spoon like that is a, it's a bit awkward. So I often do it. You've got to make sure the 
your hands are behind it all. I mean, it's asking for trouble to do it like that. So I sometimes do it like this. This is most often how I do it. I work my way down to the front. Like that. And I sort of get them a bit deeper. And they get, do a lighter cut towards the end and they get thinner as they're lighter. So if you were to use a block for this then, how would you deploy? A block? Yeah, so this carving block to kind of wedge it against. Well, make sure it's not going to move and then you can just hold it against there. And that's another safe way of doing it, especially on this side. You could also have a little groove there to stick the end of your spoon in. As I said, it's important to have your fingers behind the chisel, as with all woodwork. Like that. And then work along to the next one. I'm going from the end of the spoon handle down to the bowl because generally the grain is running in that direction anyway so you don't want to do it that way, it just tear up. Would this work with the V gouge, or was that a bit too kind of digging in? I haven't used a V gouge, but I think it would be too difficult because this is curved. It runs along, whereas the V gouge is more digging for in. doing something flatter. I think. So I start like that, and then I work back and try and even out the grooves. Where you've got a thicker bit here, you can run the groove along that thick bit. And it evens out the shape. Like that. So the whole time you're making sure you're going um, with the grain, aren't you? So you're making yes, sure you're focusing. Definitely. So to find gouges like this, would it be kind of the usual suspects like eBay, vintage tool stores, etc.? I guess so, but I know that with wood carving tools, you can buy them according to the depth of the curve and the sweep of a handle. I mean, you can get ones that go all the way like that. So, I don't know what number this is. 15 it says on it. Okay, interesting. So I'm also making sure I keep a nice curve here. So you're keeping an eye on that as well? Yeah, because what can happen is that you can start digging in too deeply on one side and you lose the shape, it becomes less domed and more kind of pointy. So maybe an obvious thing to state, but I'm stating it nonetheless for a camera. Would it be worth kind of testing out just on scrap wood? Just Absolutely, kind of that's how I started. You would, I didn't want to start on a spoon, it's too scary, so I just played around with a piece of wood. As I say, I found this in the bottom of my toolbox, 
and I wanted to see what it would do. And then um, I, I enjoyed doing the facets very much and I thought, I wonder what would happen if I run the groove along because I'd heard somewhere, I don't know where, but you can do facets with a spoon gouge and that makes a sort of, it kind of emphasises the ridges, you know, and um, so that's just the same idea but much thinner. to control it with your thumb because it can run away. Ah, oh, I see what you're doing there. Interesting. And I'll just work around, start at the sides and end up at the top. So to get that kind of taper effect at the, at the end, you're kind of lifting it up as you're Yes, apply, applying less pressure, but also I think if you start at the bottom and then work to the top, then you can layer the grooves, so the, the, the top groove will be the one that you see first. See that's covering up the one below and evening out. Like that. So Marianne, for this next technique, um, I thought it might be worth just spending a minute just talking about the blade itself. So this is something you, is this something you acquired recently, this particular one? Yes, it's a stew guy and it's got a bevel on both sides. Got a nice long piece there, and you can put your finger there if you want, or your thumb. Interesting. So with this one, what is it we're going to do now? I'm just going to cut a little outline. It's something I do quite a bit with my spoons. Just draw a little outline, and then just cut a line, a simple line, and then put the colourant in like cinnamon or coffee or whatever. So is it about cold rosin basically? Yeah. So. So once again you're bracing everything aren't you? So. I've got to make sure my fingers aren't in the way essentially. Right, so I'm just going to do a line there. And this one, in order to get the control and stay on the line, what are you doing? Are you doing anything in particular? I'm holding the knife firmly and I'm using my thumb. Oh, as a pivot? Yeah. Oh, interesting, okay. It's difficult to see for me. And you put like a downward pressure as you bring it. Yeah. Once again, I have to work down like that. So because of the tip of the blade is, is pointing down, this helps, doesn't it, with this technique? Absolutely, yeah. There. And could this be done with like a normal blade, just kind of holding it on the... I think so. I've got a, a little one here. You'd just probably be holding it differently. You'd probably hold it like that to get more control because it's straight you'd have to either hold it 
like that and push it backwards. Mm -hmm. Or I sometimes run my finger against the spoon edge like that and get a line like that. And these ones are quite readily available, aren't they? These particular ones. This one? Yeah. Bottom of the toolbox again. I'm <laughs> we need to start looking at your toolbox more. <laughs> but this one that you were using just here? Um, this is a specialist one, yeah. The stew guy. Perfect. So that's the score, and then the next step would be what? To put cinnamon in? Yeah. Rub it in. Add a drop, drop of oil. What kind of oil do you use? I'm using walnut oil because it's it's um, light. And I can see I haven't joined the lines up, so I'll just go a little bit further. And then I can clean it up with some oil, get rid of any pencil lines. Is walnut oil your preferred oil for finishing generally? Uh, I do. It's lighter. I oh, know the lin linseed oil gives better protection. But some people don't like it. I like it. It reminds me of uh, puttying windows. This basically locks the cinnamon in, doesn't it? Yeah. Now, on a light wood like that, it's gone into the grain of it. You might be able to get it out. Yeah. Half the handle the same thickness as the middle of the bottom half there and then they veer out at the end to give that characteristic split end so what Marianne is demonstrating here is something she does a lot on the spoons. It's a beautiful effect. Carry the line off across there. I do usually start this when the wood is um, greener because it can be quite hard to cut in there. But we'll see what happens. And I sometimes take it down to there. This finger gauge is really useful. So you're using the same blade you were just using earlier? Yes. So, I'll start here. So are you going into the line now? I'm going into the line. I'm following the line all the way down. And then I'm going to do the second line here. So we're going into it at a V? At an angle. 
It's quite lucky to make a V, yeah. yeah. And then when I get to the end, I take it to this other line here. Cut it in there. Go across the ends, same thing. Cut it deep there. And obviously the whole time holding it in a way that it doesn't slip out. And yeah. And then the same thing again here. You can just hold it in your hands, but it's quite good to brace it against something. It takes a bit of practice to be able to run the lines straight, but if you keep at it, you get there in the end. There's the bit that comes out there, and the bit that comes out there. Now this bit, it's a bit more tricky. So I go like that. And so that. What are you doing? Carving a, a deeper a V. Carving a V, yeah. A deeper V, okay. Yeah. The idea is that it should join up with the, the V that you, the little V that you cut down the side. comes out like that and then you just have to work across sometimes I do this with a knife it helps you get a long line like that a nice clean line So it looks like the top half is split from the bottom half, but all it is is a little line cut down there. Ah, oh, beautiful. And then I sometimes paint inside there, so it's a different colour, or paint the top half. So we have a few here as examples you've done before, to kind of illustrate the finished article. That's one I've done with coal rosing on the top and then the split end there. Ah, I see what you mean. And then you just painted that split yeah, end. Yeah, I just painted that line with a tiny, tiny brush. <laughs> Is that at the bottom of your toolbox as well? <laughs> <laughs> it is now. <laughs> and this one here, I've done the same thing. and I've just run another line around the edge and notched it out there. And then that one was from a crook, so it's got a wacky curve on it. I've done the same thing, and then I pierced it there. Oh, interesting. So you've got a hole. Oh, nice. And that. It's a good way of emphasising the hook. Beautiful. 
Beautiful. I'm just going to have a brief discussion uh, around paints. Um, so what paints are you typically using on your... I'm using milk paints. That's a paint with a, a casing as a binder, which is what you find in milk. And I started using these powdered ones, but I got very variable results, probably because I was too impatient and I didn't follow the instructions to the letter. Uh, so I now use these ones, they're German, but they're also casing paints. And they're already mixed, so there's no waiting involved. That's it. <laughs> and so with this one, these are primarily the main paints that you use for paints. Yes. Uh, with the thing. And it's just, is it just literally as, as obvious as just kind of uh, application to the spoon? Then how long do they typically take to dry these ones? Touch dry very quickly but I think to cure the paint it probably takes a few weeks. Oh, so it takes a fair while then for it to yeah. start. Yeah. And so with and the painting is it the same sort of thing where you it's best to kind of play around on scrap wood first to, to get effects and uh, stuff? And just get the colour you want. Sometimes you, you're lucky, sometimes it's not quite the right shade. So is it worth kind of getting maybe a couple of these little palettes, uh, mixing, playing around and stuff? Yeah, or a, t uh, a saucer, anything mm -hmm. really, anything washable. Mix, mix, keep mixing the paints until you get the colour you want. And experiment will show you which ones go together best. And are you still going through a lot of the phase of kind of experimenting around with different colours? and? Always, always. So there you go, my friends. That is a wrap for this video. Marianne, thank you so much. So as we mentioned earlier in this video, this video is designed to just give you a bit of an insight into the creative ways in which you can embellish your spoons. And really, these principles can be applied to any form of green woodworking within reason. Um, so the goal with this is to kind of give you some ideas into the things that you can start experimenting around with. And as Marianne mentioned before, uh, you can get scrap bits of wood. You know, would you say that's probably yeah, the best, best way? way to start. Yeah, scrap bits of wood, you've got nothing to lose and just play around with. The painting is surprisingly not even touched yet. Um, so this is something I really want to be getting into myself. Now, also as mentioned in, in the beginning of this video, uh, this is the part two to a two-part series. The first part is a very detailed video on how to carve a spoon. Once again, as I mentioned, the link below will be to that video. I'm going to highly recommend that you go and check that out. It's a fantastic video that goes into in depth the process that Mario uses from start to finish. And obviously, in this part two, we looked at some ideas and suggestions for embellishment. Now, Mario does this full time professionally, and so I'm extremely grateful that she's allowed me to come into her abode, her workspace, and to document her process. Uh, she teaches, uh, she also sells her wares, uh, they're very popular, she's very well respected amongst the spoon carving community. People that have been doing this for a very long time have a huge amount of respect for the work that she does. So in our way of saying thank you and your way, if you gain any form of uh, knowledge from this uh, whatsoever, um, all I ask from you is the following two things. Number one, if you can go check out her Instagram, and if you're on Instagram, give her a follow. And also I'll put a link to her website. Both of those links will be down below. On her website, uh, you can find out more about the work that she does, the teaching that she does, uh, you can find out about the spoons that she has for sale. Um, and also I'd encourage you while you're on the website is to join her newsletter by entering your name and email. In that way, what she'll do, she'll get in contact with you from time to time to let you know about her goings on. So like I said, the links to the Instagram or website will be down below. And it will mean the world to me if you gain any form of value from this video whatsoever. It's just your way of saying thank you to Marianne. Uh, for taking the time out for me to document her process. So, hope you enjoyed this video. Links will be down below to everything that I've mentioned. Marianne, thank you so much once again. Thanks, sir. And so, until the next time, from Marianne and myself, I hope whatever you're doing, you have a blessed day, a blessed week ahead. Peace out.